Welcome to West Church Online. My name is Todd Becker. I am the pastor to children and families here at West. I want to uh, just start by introducing our uh, roadmap to reunion. We've been talking about this uh, for a few weeks, so you're probably familiar with uh, this roadmap here. Uh, notes are services online throughout the summer and also uh, highlighted there in blue are prayer services as well as our watch parties in orange, which began this morning. Hi, everybody who's watching uh, uh, at a host site at a watch party. Uh, the prayer meetings will continue, as I said, and uh, I just want to say a few things about the prayer service. Um, actually, I just participated in one, and it is just a wonderful time of being able to come together if you uh, feel comfortable in doing that, I would encourage you to come. Uh, being together, reflecting on God's word, and then having the opportunity to prayerfully uh, pray out loud uh, the things that God has put on our hearts. So if you, uh, again, are, are comfortable with coming out, uh, there are safety protocols in place. We would ask that you would register online so we can prepare for you coming, and I would encourage you to do so. Those will continue uh, throughout the summer, as I mentioned. Also, uh, the house church watch parties. You may see uh, one of these signs driving around on Haverhill. That means that uh, there is a host site close by. Uh, we had a few people sign up, um, and they are attending uh, these watch parties. This, as I mentioned, is the first one uh, happening today. And so these will continue through the summer. And also, um, if you are interested in being a host site, uh, please just email the uh, office at West Church and we can get in touch with you. Uh, we'd love if you would open your home and uh, if you feel comfortable with that and, and invite others uh, in watching the service uh, happen on a Sunday morning. Okay, so um, we are going to have a time of uh, worship together in song, but before we do that, I'm just gonna pray uh, for us and ask that you would join me in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good and you are present with us no matter where we are. We thank you for your word, for the truth that we find there. And we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit that guides us and uh, points us to your love. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to be together in this way and to reflect on how much you love us and how you are drawing all of us together. We thank you uh, for your love and your goodness and the truths that we know about you, that you love us and that you are for us. We thank you for this opportunity uh, to worship you. And we love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I want to invite you to worship with us, and I pray this time of worship allows you to center yourself and prepare your hearts to receive what the Lord has in store for you today. Yeah. 
Sing your praise will ever be 
saints we sing worthy are you Lord you will be praised you will be praised angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know no, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She no longer has a place to hide. past behind I won't be shaken and I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. 
Good morning. My name is Shirley Paz. I serve here on pastoral staff, and I'm so glad to be with you again this morning. Our senior pastor, our lead pastor, Chris, is away this week, but he'll be back next week. Well, last Sunday, we began a series called The Spirit-Filled Life. We're going to continue that series today, but we started by talking about who the Holy Spirit is. In order to live a Spirit-filled life, we need to know who He is, right? You may want to go back and catch up on that, but briefly, God the Spirit is given to us as a helper, as an advocate, as a counselor, as a friend. We said that the Spirit's a person, the third person of the Trinity, who lives in connection with believers in order to guide us and speak truth and encourage. He points to and glorifies Jesus. He assures us of the Father's care and love. He invites us into personal relationship with God, and he transforms our character to enable us to live spiritually healthy lives. His is a communicating ministry. Did you notice all those interactive phrases I just read? He guides and speaks truth and invites. So, that brings up some great questions about how we can actually hear what it is that he's saying. Here's some questions to consider. Does God, through his spirit, really talk to us as individuals? Is there a way to know it's really God? How do we recognize his voice from other thoughts or voices that we can hear? Is the Bible the only way that God speaks? And when we make choices, is hearing God distinct from using decision-making skills? Are we supposed to just pray about it? Well, there's a lot to discuss, so we're going to jump right in. First, Christianity is based on the belief that God speaks. He initiates conversational reality. He speaks into the context of our lives, and he acts in love. Christianity is a faith of response. We may respond to his initiatives either positively or negatively, but God elicits response. The Spirit's job is to draw us into interaction with God. He wants us to know and enjoy an increasingly profound experience of living within God's redemptive love, living in response to God's capacity to make our lives rich and full and purposeful. We could say that God is supremely interested in ensuring that we hear him. So, does God speak to us individually? Yes, he does. The Spirit of God communicates to us personally. Isaiah 58 says, Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. The shepherd calls his own sheep by name and he leads them. He goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Jesus also said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. These are only a few of the verses that affirm that the Holy Spirit speaks to each one of us. Story after story of people in the Bible are filled with how they heard from God, how they were assured and directed, even how they argued or wrestled with what God said. God invites us into personal relationship. We are known by name and valued for who we are. Why is Psalm 23 the best known and best loved psalm? Because it's so personal. We long to be known and cared for the way God meets us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores me. Even when I go through a dark time, he'll protect me. He is with me. He is with me. He will surely give me good things and mercy all the days of my life, and I shall be with him forever. Well, secondly, the Spirit of God speaks through the Bible. Through his written word, we come to understand who God is and how he operates so that we can have a framework that holds us as we walk out our faith. As we study and learn from it, it's important to remember that the Bible is interactive and living. The word that describes this aliveness is inspired. Second Timothy says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture is God-breathed. That's the word inspired. And the word inspiration comes from the Latin inspiro, which means to breathe in. The Greek word for the Holy Spirit is breath of God. The Bible is unique in that God really does speak to us through it. As we engage the text, the Spirit breathes out and we breathe in. It's a living interaction. We come to God's written word to know him, not just about him. The Spirit deepens our relationship with God, helps us to know God's ways and God's heart, helps us to see reality, and draws us into an ongoing conversation of deepening intimacy. But the, Bible, the Spirit of God also speaks in a great variety of ways. There isn't anything God can't use to communicate with us. We all live in the presence of God everywhere, every day. Maybe you have an expectation that hearing God means you hear words and a voice. And if that doesn't happen, maybe you aren't hearing him. Maybe you need to reconsider and expand your notice of how the Spirit might be speaking to you in ways that you never attributed to God. Since the Spirit lives within believers, and since God knows us individually, he can and will use the particulars of our lives in order to commune with us. Some examples, not an exhaustive list for sure, are the natural world, music and the arts, events, either our own circumstances or world events, personal experiences, emotions, all of them, senses of peace or assurance of his presence, impressions or things that impact us, story, narratives that display God's character and attributes that evoke reaction, imagination and creativity, learning and understanding and discovery and insight. God can speak through social action and acts of justice and compassionate ministry. He certainly speaks through relationships and interaction with others. Maybe there are patterns or themes in your life that God may be using. God can also speak through gratitude and worship and journaling. And God definitely speaks in silence and in solitude. In our experience of God through these ways, we don't disregard God's expressed word, but we do allow the Spirit to personalize our faith and to increase our trust in him. Also, the Spirit of God speaks into the stages and seasons of our life. In relationships, certain conversations happen at certain stages of our life. The same is true in our God relationship. We can expect that God will change what he says to us as we go through life. He meets us where we are. When we're in a time of grief or suffering, for instance, the Spirit speaks differently than when we're in a season of productivity. When we're in a stage of waiting, the conversation changes 
from when we're moving fast. Accepting that God tailors the conversation to our current stage and season of life can free us to hear him speak in new and possibly surprising ways. And we can be assured that he's still speaking to us even when we hit times of discouragement and questioning or failure or facing unwanted limitations. Remaining open to the Spirit during our changing seasons and stages makes our spiritual conversation well-rounded and leads us into spiritual maturity. He will speak to you where you are. And the Spirit of God can be known through a process called discernment. The Apostle Paul writes, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Another translation of this verse says it this way. Paul prays that you will have knowledge and understanding with your love. That you will see the difference between good and bad and will choose the good. And another verse says, Now we did not receive the spirit of the world, but we received the spirit that is from God so that we can know all that God has given us. And James the little book of James, has this great verse. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So discernment, or determining what is true, is a prayerful process by which we bring insight, critical assessment, faith, and listening to the Holy Spirit in order to understand and align ourselves with what God wants. Discernment is the capacity to sense what God is doing in the moment and in the larger context of our lives. Discernment is not just for times of big choices or for determining if a thought or a spirit is evil or for times of crisis. We are called to be discerning people as a way of life. Adele Calhoun in the Spiritual Disciplines Handbook says it this way. Biblical discernment involves more than good judgment, open doors, and decision-making skills. Right discernment arises out of a relationship with God in prayer. It is founded on the reality of the Holy Spirit's presence within us, ongoing in our relationship with God. So let's get practical about how to discern. We're going to look at several steps of discernment, and with each of those steps, there will be a question for you to consider. Discernment, first, is grounded in the belief that God is good. Unless we firmly believe that what God wants is our deepest joy, we may struggle with hearing God's spirit. It will be harder to trust him and to rest in his words to us. We will hold on to control because of our competing desire to provide our own good, our own fulfillment. We may say we believe God is good, but when it comes to trusting him to guide us and answer us, we may discover discover that our hearts don't believe what our heads say. Fears and stress may sound louder than the Spirit. The ability to discern his voice, to sense what he is saying, and be assured that he is present and working will ultimately be diminished if we do not believe that God is perfectly and always good. So here's our question. Do you believe that God is for you? That despite the circumstances, he is always working redemptively for his glory and for your good. Discernment is also 
the increasing capacity and desire to respond to God's will and direction. How do we increase our capacity and desire to do God's will? This is where we must face our own agendas. Part of the process of seeking God's direction is that we must recognize what we really want. Recognizing desire is the work of the Spirit. He helps us sort and realize even those wants which are hidden from us, those blind spots. It's not wrong to have desires and to want good things. In the work of discerning, it's important that we identify as much as we can both good and malformed desires. All of those wants, all the right longings and the messed up thoughts become part of our prayerful conversation with God so that we can release our hold on our wills and our ways. And yes, sometimes that even means the good ones. We hold it like this, loosely before God. Agendas and motivations can be tied to our desires for success or our desire to be admired or to be secure. As we grow in our desire for God's will, facing our own wills is part of that growth process so that we can hear him. We sometimes call this very difficult step in discernment, coming to a place of holy indifference or objectivity. It's not that we don't care, but that we become able to let go of controlling influences in our lives. The Spirit helps us in this as he breaks the powerful holds of self-inclined agendas so that our desire for God's will can increase. So here's our question. What is it you want? Do you have an increasing desire to follow God's will? Discernment also takes time and silence. When we're anxious, we force things. Listening to God often needs slowness that we think we don't have. Discernment is not just about getting an answer, but about being with the God who is the answer. Whether or not that seems practical or efficient, the fullness of our relationship with him will not be developed if we habitually shortchange space with him. God will answer our prayers and guide us, but if we tend to make our relationship consumer-oriented, going to him just to get, we'll miss hearing him in increasing closeness and confidence. We need time to hear God. So, do you create uninterrupted quiet space to be with God? Not to get something out of the time, but to just be with him. Also, discernment listens for truth. As we listen for God's voice, we may need to understand more about him. Is our view of God grounded in truth? We may need to learn more about his nature and activity. We may need correction about his character, particularly if we learned to view him through the distortions of bad teaching or our own woundedness. For instance, if we believe him to be a harsh judge, we may think we hear him in every criticism aimed our way. Right? The Spirit teaches us truth about God's identity and all his perfect intentions for those who believe. Also, as we listen for God's voice, we will need to understand the truth about ourselves. What makes us the way we are? How are we prone to think 
Why do we respond the ways we do? These things color how and what we hear. The more we know ourselves in truth, the more we can know God. And the more we know God rightly, the more we can know ourselves truthfully. Jesus said it this way. He said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth can set us free to hear God with unrestricted and open hearts. Here's your question. Are you willing to trust the love of God as he speaks truth to you about yourself? Will you open yourself to hearing the truth about God's character and lavish grace for you? Discernment also considers well. Discernment leads us somewhere. It leads us to understanding. It leads us into making decisions. And it leads us into change. In order to get there, we must consider we use our minds, skills of judgment and determination, information, experience, and wise counsel as tools to help us consider. All of these can and should be used as God-given sources of wisdom. Discernment is not uninformed or opposed to responsible consideration of circumstances, problems, obstacles, opportunities, abilities, pros and cons. As we examine our situation, as we consider, we pray for God's Spirit to illumine what we can see with what He can see. Not every closed door that we see means stop. Not every limitation deters God's plan to bless us. Not all invitations should be accepted. We partner with the Holy Spirit and listen well as we consider. So here's a good question for you. How do you tend to make decisions? How is God a part of that process? Discernment also weighs competing voices. Gordon Smith in the book, The Voice of Jesus, says, to discern is to make a distinction between the voice of Jesus and those competing voices that invariably speak in our hearts and minds. Sometimes these voices are nothing more than our own inner emotional turmoil. Sometimes the voices we hear are the spoken and unspoken expectations of others. And there is no doubt that sometimes we come face to face with the subtleties of the evil one. In 1 John, we hear this verse, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. We test to know what is from God through scripture and biblical principles. We filter through that first. We also test through seeking experienced Christian counselor. We talk with others who are experienced and who can give us good counsel. We test through looking at the fruit, what's produced as we are examining what we're hearing. Is it indicative of the Spirit's presence, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all the fruit of the Spirit? Or is it something else? Are we feeling or sensing unrighteousness or fear or anger or lies or confusion? What's present? We also test through paying attention to the tone and quality and weight and content of what we're hearing and sensing. When Jesus spoke to people, they were often struck by the authority and the power of the truth in his words. And they were also struck with conviction by the clarity of his questions. Very clear tone and weight, right? 
Is what you're hearing significant with truth and clarity, or is it unsettling and condemning? Is the tone and quality consistent with God? Does it seem life-giving, or is it life-draining? So the question here is, how do you distinguish between what moves you toward God and what draws you away from him? And then finally, discernment takes place within community. The essence of Christian community is that instead of self-reliance and figuring things out on our own terms, we join with others with Jesus. Jesus makes our community Christian community. Without Jesus, it's human community. Christian community is never just all about us. It's about the transforming presence of Jesus with us all. Christian community is about what he will do in and through each of us. We need each other to help hear the Spirit. The church is God's plan and his body, and his Spirit equips us with spiritual gifts that are meant for interactive growth. Gifts like teaching and prayer and other things like humility and commitment and perseverance, worship. Also, trials, friction that must be worked out, forgiveness and serving others. Ruth Haley Barton says, in community, others become agents of God's troubling grace for our further growth and transformation, and we become the same for them. It is the lack of community, a privatized approach that fails to see other people as necessary instruments of God's grace that limits the work of God. So, do I participate in Christian community in such a way that I am directed by the Holy Spirit to be a grace receiver and a grace giver? Now, I know this has been a lot of information about how to hear God and steps to take, things to examine, but I'd like to end by circling back to a question that I asked last week as we looked at all of this. Why is it that God wants to talk with us? Why does he desire that you hear him? I think a very simple answer to this is because his heart wants our hearts. His heart wants your heart. In perfect love and power, he invites us into a conversation that redeems our hearts, that makes us whole, so that we can fully give and receive love for the abundance of our own lives and for the sake of others. God is on a mission to claim our hearts and to make them whole through his love. On the road to Emmaus, two disciples who met the risen Jesus but didn't know it was him at that moment asked themselves after they heard him speak to them, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us. As you listen for his voice, don't let it be a formula, but be sure to listen with your heart. And now I'd like to give you a benediction, which comes from scripture. 2 Thessalonians 3.5 says this, May the Lord direct your heart's to the love of God, and to the steadfastness of Christ. Amen.
And sorrow comes to steal the joy I own Brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love I am not a captive to the lies And I'm not afraid to leave my past behind And I won't be shaken And I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stay Stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your 